Hello, and welcome to yet another Python crash course. Just a heads up, this crash course is very fast paced. It's mostly designed for people coming into Python from another language such as C, Java, PHP, JavaScript, and you're already familiar with your primary coding language, but you want to learn Python. So in this course, I'm actually not covering every single topic known to humanity. This is after all a crash course, not a let's go into detail course. So in this very fast paced crash course, we're going to skim a lot of subjects here. Uh, so we're going to look at where Python is used, how to install Python, how to run Python code, loading an experimental Python shell, IPython, uh, how to do some math, how variables work. Uh, we're going to look at some Python syntax. We'll use indentation. It's a little weird at first if you're brand new to Python, but it is lovely once you get used to it. We're going to look at different ways to format your strings, conditional statements like if else statements, basically telling your program what to do based on certain conditions. Uh, we're going to look at loops, functions, scope, classes, packages, error flow with try and accept, and a bunch of stuff in between. So if you're looking for a fast paced Python crash course, this is it. This is the course that you want. Now, if you're brand new to Python, I would highly suggest not watching this. This is going to be too fast and too high level to really understand too much. Again, this, this crash course is really designed for people coming in from Java or C or some other language where you've been fairly involved and you already know about things like functions, data types, and loops and things like that. So once more, just as a warning, if you're coming in from another language that you're pretty confident in, this is good for you. Hello and welcome to the Python 3 crash course. Now, I've mentioned this before and I'm going to mention it again, and over time, I'm going to mention it more. Uh, but this course is not a super in-depth course. This is a crash course. You're not going to learn everything, uh, but you're going to learn everything that's important very, very quickly. It is a very high-paced course. Uh, so if I ever go too fast, you might want to do a little bit of research on your own, and that's okay. So first things first, where is Python used? Uh, Python is used in all sorts of places. Uh, Python is used in, let's make that a little smaller. It's used in things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, websites, video games, you know, self-driving cars, pretty much anything, desktop programs, uh, all sorts of database management, not necessarily to create databases, but to work with databases. There's all sorts of things that Python can do. So basically, if you're thinking, hmm, is this software related? Is this software related? If the answer is yes, then chances are Python is involved in that industry somehow. So self-driving cars, is Python involved? Probably. What about data science? You know how everyone uh, hates the fact that Facebook is collecting so much information on us all the time? Data science. Python is used for a lot of that as well. Google is using Python. Uh, I believe YouTube was originally created using Python. Instagram was definitely created using Python, used a Python framework called Django. So basically, where is Python used? The answer is basically everywhere, just about everywhere. Okay, if you don't have Python installed on your computer, actually you probably do, but if you don't, or if you want the newer version of Python, you can open up your browser and go to python.org. So you'll see a website that looks basically like it's never changed throughout time. Click on downloads, and you can always just click the latest version. It will try to detect your computer for you, so if you're using Linux or Windows or Mac, you can just click this button and it will download the latest version for you, and then you can install it. That's really all there is to installing Python. All right, in Python, you are going to see files that end in .py, and there is a particular way to run these files. So once you have Python up and running and it's installed on your computer, you can open up your command line. I'm just using VS Code, so I've got my command line open, open here, my terminal, uh, but you don't have to use that. You can also use terminal, commander, PowerShell, Bash, anything else, and really all you have to do is, I'm just going to close this because I don't want to use that one, uh, all you have to do is type Python and then 
your file.py. So let's create an example here. I'm gonna create a new file and just save this as how to run a Python file.py ends in .py. And in here, I'm just gonna say print hello world. And that is literally it, nothing fancy. Now to execute this file, first of all, I can do ls-la. See, I've got a file in here called how to run a Python file.py. So Python, and then I just type H-O-W, hit tab, and it auto-completes for me. If it doesn't auto-complete, you can copy and paste the name, or you can type the whole name out by hand. And it says in here, hello world. Python comes with this thing called a shell. It's actually got a few different names. The most common one that I've seen lately is called a shell. Uh, and basically all it is, is an interactive place where you can play with Python. And so you can open up your command line program, could be terminal, could be bash, could be anything, um, and literally just type the word Python. So if you, if you type Python-V, this will show you which version of Python you're using, and you can just type Python and it gets you into this Python shell. And in here you can write regular Python. So you can do things like five plus 11 is 16. You can also print Hello, fella. And it prints it for you. So you can actually type straight Python in here. You don't necessarily have to type your Python in a .py file and then execute it every single time like we saw just a little bit earlier. So that's how we get in. If we want to get out, we can literally just type the word exit with parentheses. It's a function, helps us get out. All right, let's talk about some basic math in Python. And this is pretty global for most programming languages. So if we just get into our Python shell here, we can do some simple addition. So, you know, 10 plus 10 is going to be 20. Uh, we could do some subtraction as well. So addition, we used the plus sign. And I just made that a little bigger. Uh, so subtraction is just a dash, the minus sign. So let's say 91 minus 45 is 46. To multiply, you can do eight and then an asterisk eight. So that's the star symbol. That'll give us 64, eight times eight is 64. Uh, to divide, we could do 64 slash eight and that's how we divide and that's going to give us 8.0, that's eight as well. Uh, we can do exponents as well. So if we wanted to do three to the power of three, we could do three star star three. So two asterisks side by side means three to the power of three. So this is going to be three times three is nine times three again is going to be 27. Lastly, we have this really interesting one called modulus. Uh, and that basically just gives us a remainder. So you know how you do like 10 divided by three and you get this remainder that 0.33333335 computer science quirk for you. Uh, but if you wanted to get the remainder, you could do percent sign that's modulus three. And what this says is three goes into 10 three times, doesn't care about that, throws that answer away. And this will return the number one because there's a remainder of one. So three, six, nine, and then three can't go into the remainder of whatever that's going to be. So 10 minus nine is going to be one. That's your remainder. All right, let's talk about variables. Variables are pieces of data stored in your computer's memory. Basically, we give pieces of memory names in computers because humans just can't remember everything. Computers are made to remember everything. Human brains suck at it. So if we get into Python here, we can create a variable name is equal to Python crash course. And basically what this did was it took this value in here and it said, okay, allocate a little piece of memory behind the scenes in my computer and then just give it like a, a pseudo name, like a code name called name. And it doesn't have to be called name. We could have named it anything else. But down the road, we can then access it by just typing name. We could print name as well. We could see the type of name. We'll get into these a little bit later. You can see that's a string, but basically we can manipulate this now. We've stored this value in something that's easier to type. Okay, let's talk about indentation. In other languages, you see us use these curly brackets all the time. And once you learn indentation with Python, you're going to look at these curly braces in JavaScript and other languages like PHP. And you're going to think, wow, how did I ever live with that? But at first, it's going to be a little bit weird. 
So in Python, let's just get into our, our shell here. We don't write things like if name is equal to Python and then a curly brace. That gives us a syntax error. Python does not like that. What we do do instead is let's create a name here called Python, just a regular variable. We do say if name is equal to Python and then a colon. And then we can do some indentation. So uh, we could indent one, two, three, or four. Typically, we indent four in Python. And then we could say, your name is Python. And that executes for us. Then prints, your name is Python. So we don't use curly braces around this. We don't have to. Instead, we use uh, colons. We use a lot of colons. And we also use indentation. So often, the tab key will work or just four spaces. Typically, I'll use the tab key. Uh, but I'll set my editor up to understand that tab actually means four spaces. It doesn't have to, but generally that's what you're going to see. Now one thing to note is anything that's indented under sort of like this line that has a colon in it, that means this belongs to this. So this cannot run if this does not return true. This, whatever this is, maybe it's going to create a new file, maybe it's going to do something different, we don't know yet. But whatever this is means it is reliant on this either being true or being executed or anything like that. Uh, so we can get into that a little bit later, I think. All right, uh, you know what? I've been doing this a lot. And honestly, this is gross because there's like no syntax highlighting or anything. Uh, so what you can do is you can do pip install ipython. I should already have this in here. Yep, and then I can just type ipython. And look at that, I am inside of IPython. And it has like nice little syntax highlighting and works with indentation and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so let's, uh, from now on, start using IPython. I'm going to use IPython. If you don't want to, that's fine. You don't have to. Uh, but I'm going to just because like, gives me something nice. If name is equal to hi, print, hi, 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 hi. And it just looks a little nicer. So I'm going to start using that from now on. Now let's take a look at data types. So let's open up IPython or just regular Python if you don't want to use interactive Python, that's cool too. Uh, we have these things called data types. So we have different ones. We've got strings, lists, dictionaries, tuples, sets, booleans, and many, many, many more. Uh, but these are probably the most common ones you're going to work with day in and day out. So it's important to know these. So a string is basically a sentence. Name, Caleb Tallinn. It has a space in there. It has basically regular characters that you would normally type on your keyboard. And it starts with an opening and closing quotation. It doesn't have to start with that. It could also open and close with uh, an apostrophe. But whichever one you use, they have to be the same. So it has to start with and end with the exact same one. Then if we did type name, we're going to see that this is, in fact, a string. And inside of a string, you can put anything in there. Now, unlike a variable, you can't just name a variable anything. You can't just say, like, 84 underscore name is equal to thing. This just doesn't work. That's not a good variable name. Just stick with regular, boring variable names and variable characters. And that's really all you're going to have to do. To use variables. So we looked at name. That's a string. Next, we have lists. So, you know, a list could be, like, your groceries is equal to, and it opens and closes with hard brackets like this. And we could do, I don't know, milk, eggs, and ice cream, because I'm an adult and that's what I want for breakfast, I guess. Uh, then we could do groceries. And this stores several different da uh, data types in here. So it says three items, milk, eggs, and ice cream. And we can see that it comes back as milk, eggs, and ice cream. Then we can loop over that a little bit later. And if we do type, groceries, we'll see it's a list. We'll talk more about loops and, and things like that a little bit later. Next, we have dictionaries. So we could have a dictionary, and this takes a key value pair, and it opens and closes with curly braces. This is one of the times you're going to see curly braces in Python. So we have this thing called a key value pair. And we could say the name is Caleb. And the language is Python. 
So this has a little bit of an interesting syntax. We can hit enter person. We can also get details out of this. So we can say person with a hard bracket and then get that name. And that's going to be Caleb. Or if we did the same thing with language, this is going to be Python. So it's sort of like a variable inside of a variable uh, with a naming convention added. Dictionaries are also super fast in Python. Uh, so it's a really good way of storing similar data. Next, we have these things called tuples or tuples. Not really sure. People seem to say that differently. Uh, but basically, we have groceries, but a tuple uh, would be like a list that you cannot change. So your grocery list, when you go to the store, maybe you see a chocolate bar that you like. Maybe you want to pick up oranges or bananas or something. Well, you just change your list, but a tuple cannot change. And you have two kids, and that's all you ever want. So you've got one called Nathan, and you've got one called Zephyr. So that is a tuple. It starts with and ends with regular parentheses. And if we do type kids, it's a tuple. Now the thing is, tuple cannot change. We cannot remove an item. We cannot add an item. It is there forever until we remove the variable or overwrite the, the variable entirely. Whereas a regular list, we can totally change it. Next up, we have these things called sets. Now a set is a lot like a list and a lot like a tuple in some degree it's some form in the middle so a set can have items added and removed just like a regular list not really like a tuple at all except for the fact that it holds multiple items but a set is totally unique so if we said foods is equal to and a set looks like this it looks a lot like a dictionary but there's no key value pair in there so foods is equal to pizza tacos ice cream and let's say we had pizza in there twice and pizza in there three times because my diet is made of pizza and tacos, apparently. I hit enter on that and I saved that into a variable called foods. And when I type foods in here, you're going to see that ice cream, pizza and taco show up. Now, this is interesting because ice cream was not the first item in there. It did not remember my order. Tuples and lists do. Pizza showed up three times. A set said, no, you don't need it three times. This is a unique list. so. You can have pizza once. Taco showed up twice, but in the set, it was like, <laughs> you don't need tacos twice. It's the same item. So just make sure it's unique. So it only showed ice cream, pizza, and tacos once each, despite there being numerous items in there. Last but not least, we have these things called Booleans. And a Boolean is literally just true or false with a capital T or a capital F. So am, an, am I an adult? That's true. Is adult. Type is adult. It's a bool, short for boolean. And so that can ever only be true or false. Now that's data types in a nutshell. There's actually a lot more and there's a lot more that comes with each one. But again, remember, this is a crash course, a fast paced crash course. And we're not going to be going in depth too much about how all of these work individually. All right, let's take a look at indexing. So I'm going to open up IPython or regular Python if you want to use regular Python. Indexing is a way to basically pull out a particular item from a list of things. So let's say we have course is equal to Python 3 crash course. We can see that this is in fact a string. And let's say we just wanted to get a particular letter. Let's say we wanted to get number three. Well, in computers, we start counting at zero. So we go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So let's go ahead and type course seven. And we get the three in there. Now let's say we wanted to just get the word crash. We could do one, two, three, four, five, six seven, eight, nine, and then 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then up to 15. So let's go ahead and do course 10, what did I say, 10 and 15? Nope, that was wrong. Nine and 14, there we go. I just counted poorly the first time. I probably just missed something in there. Uh, but that is basically indexing on a string. So you can get an individual character just by counting the numbers in there. Again, it starts with zero, or you can get uh, a whole range of characters by using a colon, so where it starts and where it should go up to. Next, we also can index lists and tuples. So we could do 
foods is a list. We've got pizza. We've got Dr. Pepper, popsicles, and we have, I don't know, chicken, I guess. So let's say we wanted to get the first item, we would do foods, zero. That's the first item, that's pizza. Computers start counting at zero for the most part. And that's what we're going to see here. Let's say we wanted to get this item all the way to the end. We could do number one, because it's one, two, three, and just leave that empty, and that gives us the rest of them. So it's saying, start at number one, and then go to basically the end. We could do the opposite as well. We could do foods, start anywhere, and then go up to do number one. So it's going to say, okay, we'll get everything up until item number one. And last but not least, we can also do a, a full range in here. So we can get like just Dr. Pepper popsicles and chicken if we wanted to with foods, one and two. Nope, that was a lie. Foods, oh, I'm making so many typos here. Uh, we actually want foods one to three because it goes up into that point so zero one we also want number two and go up to number three number three doesn't exist so it's just going to hit the end of the list for us and there we go okay let's talk about code comments code comments are really really easy in python we don't really have too many different ways to make code comments we have two primary ways uh, so you could have some code here but if you wanted to comment this out, you just use a number sign in front of it, and Python will not execute it, versus some code here. And if we hit enter, it gives us invalid syntax. So if ever you want to leave some notes, which you probably should in your code, you're going to want to leave comments. Next, you can also leave comments in the form of a doc string. So this is sort of getting ahead of ourselves for the moment, but if we have a function called thing, we could add a doc string in here. Hello world. Also notice the indenting. So everything under here belongs to the function called thing. This is called a doc string. It's a form of commenting. You can use three quotation marks. You can use three apostrophes. As long as it ends and opens with the exact same thing, so quotations or apostrophes, you can have whatever you want in the middle, and it works on multiple lines. Let's take a look at string formatting quickly. I'm gonna open up IPython, you can open up regular Python. And string formatting, uh, oh, there's so many different ways to format strings in Python. It's actually pretty annoying. It's one of the things that drives me nuts about Python, but modern Python has some really nice things. So Python 3.5, so Python 3.5 has this feature called format, and we can format strings. So we could say the course is equal to some course, for everybody. And then we could format that with Python or any other variable. So actually, even as a better example, let's do this. Name is equal to Python. And let's go to the end here. And let's not put another string in here with formatting. Let's put a name in here. So course is equal to, and whatever the opening and curly braces are, again, this is one of those weird times where, you, where you'll see curly braces as in string formatting. Uh, it's basically going to run this format function on it and it's going to inject name, which is Python, into here. Name is still Python. Course is Python for everybody. Now that's Python 3.5 and up. In Python 3.6 and up, we have these things called f strings. f string is really, really nice. So we've got this name called Python, and we could say print, and we put an f in front of our string, and then we open and close our string, we put whatever we want in here the crash course language is, and then in here we can just put an opening and curly brace, opening and closing curly brace, with the variable name inside of it. So it automatically knows that this belongs to the name variable up there, and we can just hit, bam, hit enter. And this crash course is language Python. Basically, it just took the name and it safely injected it in there for us. Now, there's actually a lot to unpack in there. Uh, <laughs> f strings and uh, formatting can get very very complicated but from python 3.5 and forward you're going to see a lot of that uh, you also might see something like print hello s and then world you'll see this in older versions of python as well uh, where basically we we said here's a string well this whole thing is a string uh, but we're going to use a string in there and the first value using the percent sign is going to be world we can do the same thing with a variable, hello Python. 
Now, again, this is older Python, but you're still going to see that. And again, there's a lot to unpack in there. Really, we're just scratching the surface here. But you're going to see f-strings a lot in Python 3.6 and newer. You're going to see the dot .format method a lot in Python 3.5 and newer. And you'll see this in older versions of Python. Let's go ahead and create and uh, read some files now. So you can actually see that I'm running this in my folder called Python 3 Crash Course inside of my Dropbox, and I've got one file in here. We can verify that in here. So when I execute Python or IPython, it's going to run in this same folder. And if I run PWD uh, from IPython, you can actually see that that's exactly where I'm at. So let's go ahead and create a new file. We're going to create a new file using the with keyword and the open keyword. And we're going to create a file called file.txt. Actually, you know what? Let's do something cooler. Let's create a file, a Python file that we can actually execute a little bit later. So try me.py. That's the file name. And we're going to open up this file with the, uh, the write permissions. Uh, so basically, we're going to create a new file and we're going to write to it as file handler. And that file handler is not the actual file itself. It's just the handler to help us manage the file. So then we can say file handler dot write print hello world la 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 just to show us something in here file underscore handler dot close and let's go ahead and run that and you can see my file try me dot pi showed up let's just move that down and it says Print hello world. Actually, that print should have been a lowercase p. Print hello world. La 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 la. Now, if we wanted to read this, we could do the same thing. We could put this into a variable in our Python as well. So we could say with open try me dot pi. This file needs to exist already with the reading permission as file handler or fh for short. Fh dot read. Actually, we want to do content is equal to fh dot read. And then we always want to close that file handler. It's just a good practice to do that anyways. Uh, so fh.close. Let's try that again. fh.close. Nailed it. And let's type content. Print content. We can see that in there as well. So that is opening a file, creating a new file, and reading a file. If we wanted to append it to this file, we could do that as well. So we could say with open tryme.py a for append, so add this to the, the back of the file as file handler, fh.write, testing line number two, fh.close, and I made a little mistake in there. I forgot to make a new line, actually, with slash n for new line, so let's go ahead, and this is going to be line two. Uh, originally, <laughs> that was what my example was supposed to be. Uh, but I forgot that slash n, which is an invisible character. You don't actually see it in your files, but it tells your computer to make a new line. So let's go ahead and execute this. And there we go. So I messed up there because I forgot the hidden slash n, uh, and it should have gone to a new line there. But, you know, regardless, it's still appended to the file twice, so the example is still actually pretty good. All right, let's take a look at comparison operators. I'm going to open up IPython again. And a comparison operator really is just checking to see if something is or is not true, or if something can be executed. So we can say the lang is equal to Python 3. Let's make this a string, though. So we have lang is equal to Python 3. Now we can say if lang is equal to Ruby, print you're using Ruby. We can also say else if, l if, the lang is equal to Python 2, print, <laughs> print, oh my god, please upgrade, k, thanks, bye, because Python 2 is old. We can also say else, print, anything else, the value was, and we can use an f string in here, lang. Now we just want to make sure that that is an f string with the character f in front of it. 
Let's go ahead and execute this code. And we're going to see it's anything else with the value uh, that was Python 3. So basically, this is going to say if the code is equal to Ruby, then print this. It wasn't. If the lang is equal to Python 2, then oh so my god, please upgrade. Okay, thanks. Bye. But it didn't match either of these. And so this is the one that was executed. Now, if we go ahead and change lang again, we can actually hit up. Lang is equal to, let's do Python 2. And let's rerun this again. And now it runs the Python 2 line. And if we go all the way up again, and let's change this to Ruby, which is a lie. We're not using Ruby. This one is going to say you're using Ruby, which it is. And so basically, this is an if statement, a conditional or a comparison operator. And it's saying that it has to be an exact match. This is an else if saying it also has to be an exact match. So this is comparing uh, whatever the variable value of lang is, which we know in this case was Ruby, uh, to this value here. Now, if that isn't a match, Python says, skip it. Don't run this indented code. Go to the next one. It says, okay, well, we've got outdented code. If the lang is then equal to Python 2, then run this. Well, in our first example, it was not that, so it skipped it. Then it said, for every other scenario, just print it. We don't really care what it is. We just need to have like a, a catch-all behind the scenes. Now, we have all sorts of comparison operators in here. We have, uh, we can do like age is equal to 20, <laughs> I wish. And we can say if age is equal to 20, print, it's nice being 20. Okay, so that's an exact comparison. Uh, we could also say if age is greater than or equal to 10, print, you're older than 10. Now that's going to execute, but what if we said, you know, the age has to be higher than 30? The age is currently 20, which we can see up here. And this is not going to run for us. It says basically, if 20 is greater than or equal to 30, then run this code. But that's not true. <laughs> number 20 is not greater than or equal to number 30. So Python says, nope, that's not true. Don't execute that. We also have a few other comparison operators in here. So we've got the equals to, so make sure it's the exact same. Greater than, equal to, that's good for numbers. Just a standard greater than, standard less than, standard less than is equal to. And we have a is not operator. So let's see what age is. Age is 20. So we can say if age does not equal to exactly 30, print you are not exactly 30. And we can see that executed because age does not equal 30. 20 does not equal 30. Is that right? 20 and 30 are not the same? That's correct. I know it's weird logic to sort of think that way. But that's computer programming in a nutshell. Print, you are not exactly 30. There's a bunch of other comparison operators that Python comes with as well, such as is, which is a really cool one. We're not going to get into that because this is a crash course, but you can also, you know, really try like total is equal to none. So if we did this, type total, it's a none type. Uh, it's a data type. We can say if total is none. Print is none. Is none. So there is a difference between is and the two equal signs, but um, we're not going to get into that right now. For more explanation on that, uh, however, I do have a Python for Everybody course. It is a larger course that goes over uh, a lot of the stuff that we are just flying by right now. So uh, if you're interested in a larger Python course, definitely check that out. Uh, it goes a lot, lot slower. I talk more about these things more in depth as well. Okay, let's talk about for loops. You're going to see these everywhere. These are very, very important. Uh, so we could have a list like groceries, which doesn't currently exist in this instance. There we go. So I just did a reverse search there with control R. Let's clear that, make some room, groceries. So we have this list of groceries and in a for loop, we can actually loop through each one and just print them out or, or do anything we want. So we can say for item in groceries and that's going to basically assign item to milk and then when it's done, it's going to assign item to eggs and then when it's done, it's going to assign item to ice cream. And so we can say print F the item is and then whatever the item is going to be and that's in an F string. And it says the item is milk, the item is eggs, the items 
uh, the item is ice cream. Now basically a for loop is just going to go through an iterable as much as it can until it hits the very end. Now an iterable could be a set, could be a set, could be a tuple, strings are also iterables, could be a list, there are all sorts of iterables out there. Um, so we're not going to get too much into all the iterables because that's like getting into all the data types. There's a lot out there, and if it's an iterable, you can loop through it. So we can actually say name is equal to Python 3 crash course. And there's a space in there, so that's kind of annoying. Uh, but what we can do now is name dot trim. And it's not trim. I'm pretty sure that was just JavaScript. It's name dot strip. Nailed it. So now it doesn't have spaces. It just stripped the space from the end of either side of that string. So that's a cool little thing. We can do for letter in name, print letter. Ooh, okay, that turned out kind of gross, but it does say Python 3 crash course one letter at a time, including all the spaces. So let's do one more example uh, where we can break and continue. So let's do for letter in name, and whatever that letter is going to be, we're just going to take letter dot lowercase. So it's going to turn like the P, C, and C all into lowercase letters. And then we're going to put it in a variable called L. Then we can say, if L is in some sort of list. So let's list, so let's list out the variables A, E, I, O, U. And we'll also include Y just for funsies sake. And then we can say, print, F string, vowel is, and then whatever L is going to be and then continue. So basically we're saying if the lowercase letter is a vowel, then print it out and just continue the loop. So let's see what this looks like now. Okay, and I actually made a weird little uh, error there. Uh, I don't want to look for it in a list. I want to look for L in the string A, E, I, O, U, and Y. So let's go ahead and run this one. It says vowel is Y. There's a Y in Python. There's an O in Python. There's an A in the word crash course. And in the word course, there's an O, U, and E. So basically, it's just printing out all the vowels for us. We can also go ahead and say if L is equal to exactly three, because we had the name Python 3 crash course, break. And we could do a print in here. Print breaking on three. And so it's going to go through all the vowels. Uh, it's going to try to print them out. Uh, and then it says, you know what, if that letter is actually three, then break. Basically, quit the loop, quit working, just exit out of the loop and keep running regular code. So continue is how we cycle through another loop iteration so that we don't have to actually, you know, continue all this code. Continue says, okay, once that code is triggered, don't worry about this stuff. Uh, break, on the other hand, is as soon as break is hit, it actually exits the for loop entirely. And both continue and break are useful on the next type of loop called a while loop, which we'll talk about in just a sec. Okay, let's take a look at some while loops here. In the last video, we did four letter in name and then print the letter. That's cool. And it's going to go through every item in an iteration or an iterable rather. Uh, but a while loop is going to go on forever. So a while loop, you actually need to tell it when to stop. So we could basically say while something is true, print a thing. And this will run forever until you tell it to stop, which is not generally what you want. So I'm going to cancel that and I'm going to create some sort of stopper. So number is equal to zero. And we're going to say while this is true. So while the number is less than, uh, let's do 10. Print num. And then we're also going to say num is equal to num plus one. And what this is going to do is start at zero, say zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and just like that. And then it stops. And that's because at some point num was actually the number 10. So this only works if number is less than 10. Now it doesn't know when to stop. You have to tell it when to stop. You can use numbers, you can use Booleans, you can use all sorts of stuff, but essentially it's going to run forever. while you have this running. And you can actually see that's just going to continue to run forever until I actually hit Control C and cancel.
Okay, let's take a look at list comprehensions. List comprehensions are basically how we generate a list in a single line of code. And we can do all sorts of stuff with this. And these are really common in Python. You're going to see these everywhere. So do we still have groceries? We do. But nah, maybe let's not do that. Let's create a new list of nums. And we've got one, two, three, four. And let's skip over to seven, eight, nine, and 10. And you can see that we have one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's say we wanted to do something here. We wanted to get all of these numbers times 10. So times 10, we could do this. For num in nums, just like a regular for loop. But over here on the left, we want to produce an answer. So this is just going to return each number. And maybe let's take a look at this. Times 10, this is going to be the exact same as nums at this point. So nothing is different between out 37 and out 39. But we could say num times 10 times 10. And now it's multiplied all of them, put each one of those numbers into a list for us. So it's now 10, 20, 30, 40, 70, 80, 90, and 100. That is a list comprehension. We can also, if we wanted to be a little more fancy with this, add an if statement. So we can also say, only do this if the uh, number is going to be even. So whatever that number is going to be, so if num has a modulus uh, divided by two is equal to zero. So if five divided by two, does that have a remainder? Yes, it does, it has a remainder of one, so that's not going to work. Uh, but four, four divided by two, does that have a remainder? No, because two goes into four two times very smoothly. Uh, so there's no remainder, and this is going to only uh, work for even numbers. And times 10. And now we have 20, 40, 80, and 100. So that's list comprehensions in a nutshell. Let's talk about functions. Functions in Python are used with this particular syntax called DEF, like you're defining a function. And then it just has some sort of name and parentheses, and then it returns something. Return is a keyword. You can see that it's bold and green as well, same, same as def return a thing. So now we can say name, and because we're in basically a Python shell, it's going to show us what this value is, but it's actually not going to put it into a variable. We can, with the return keyword, run this function, just like that, and put it into uh, a variable. So we call it my thing is equal to name as a function. My thing is now equal to a thing, whatever that returns. Now that is a function in a nutshell, a very, very basic nutshell. We could also make this a lot more complicated. We could say def greeting, which is actually not super complicated, but it's going to take a name and we're going to say print name. Hello to you. Good, sir. And that's an F string. And now we can do greeting Caleb. And because that's a variable, that's an argument. We can now use that inside of this function uh, and we can just pass it in as like a regular string or a variable or a list or anything like that. Now the thing about this is this is not using the return keyword. So if I said greet is equal to greeting Zephyr, who is my cat, it still prints this out for me. But if we do greet, there's nothing. And if we do type of greet, this returns a none type. So by default functions return none. Now that's one argument. Let's go ahead and add another argument. Def greeting, we're just going to overwrite the old one. Name is some name, uh, but the greeting itself is going to be a default of hello. So now we can say return an F string with name in it. And then greeting to you. Now let's run greeting Henry, who is my other cat. And I'm not going to specify a greeting. So this one is just going to take the name, but greeting is saying, okay, well, if you don't specify, this is going to be the default. So let's run that. And it says, hello, or Henry, hello to you. And because we're using the return keyword, we can put that in some sort of variable. So let's put it as x is equal to greeting Bob. We see nothing. x is now actually a string. We can do type of x is a string. 
So a function can take in zero or more arguments. Uh, it can have, every argument can have some sort of default value. This is called a keyword argument, and this is called a regular argument. Uh, you'll often see them called args and star star quargs. But the idea is basically you have this function uh, and you can give it any number of parameters. It can do some sort of logic in here and it's supposed to spit out or return something. By default, it will return none, but you can return a string, a number, a float. A float is a number, an integer, dictionary, list, set, tuple, frozen set, you name it. Uh, you can basically return anything from a function. And in fact, you can actually return a function from a function in Python. All right, let's take a look at scope. Variables are searched from within, uh, and then they move outside and then outside, which is kind of a weird way of putting that. But let's say we have a variable out here called name Tim. We could have a function in here, def, hello, print Tim. And when we run hello, uh, it's not Tim. <laughs> the name was Tim. The variable name was name. And when we run this, it'll now say Tim. So let's back up a step and uh, let's do that properly. Name is equal to Tom. Def hi. Print name. That's going to print this value, whatever this is going to be. Uh, da -da 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 -da, and we say hi. And there we go, Tom shows up. Now we didn't specify this name inside of here, but if we did, it would overwrite it. So name is going to continue to exist outside of this function. Let's overwrite this function now with a new name, a default name. And instead of Tom, we're going to use Michael. And when we run hi, it's going to run Michael by default. So basically what it's saying here is there is a variable inside of your function called name. By default, it's called Michael. But up here, there is no variable in here being passed in as an argument into your function called name. So it's going to look outside of it. So your function looks inside of itself for the variable it's looking for. If it doesn't find it, it's going to look outside of the function for it. Now, if it doesn't exist, then we're going to run into a problem. Def test a thing, print a variable that does not exist in here, does not exist variable test a thing, you can see that Python didn't actually execute it. Python just said, okay, register that test a thing is a function. But now that we're going to execute it, we're going to get a name error. Test does not exist is not defined. But let's do this. Let's make it exist. Does not, and <laughs> I spelled it as exit. Uh, so we're just going to go with that. And we're going to put Caleb in here. And let's rerun this. And now it works, even though in our function, we didn't specify that variable. It's looking outside of it. It said, doesn't exist in here. Look outside the function. Okay. It does exist in there now. We can use that. Originally, it said this function does not exist in here. It also does not exist outside of this function. I have no idea what you're referencing. Cannot figure it out. Okay, let's take a look at some classes. So in Python, basically everything is an object, uh, and we can create our own objects. So, like how we saw before with some string dot format string is an object it's a class and dot format is a method so we can actually do something with that in python we can create our own classes as well so we can say class person pass and this is how we create a regular class and then we could say caleb is equal to person with parentheses around it caleb type of caleb and we're going to see that type of caleb is a person that's what i defined it as and when we just type Caleb, it doesn't even have a name. It knows that it's running this current script. It's using the class called person. And this is where it's actually stored in our memory inside of our computer. Classes can also have basically variables inside of them called attributes and functions inside of them called methods. So we can create a new class called person. And inside of it, the default name could be Caleb. And then we can say Caleb is equal to new person. And then if I do Caleb.name, it shows up with Caleb. Now this is referencing up here. This was actually a terrible example, but this is referencing this part and uh, this data point here. It's not actually referencing this. You can, tell, you can tell the difference 
between them because one is a capital K and one is a lowercase k. Classes also have functions called methods. So we can create a class person and we can give it a method in here of speak. Now in a class, by default, it always takes the first parameter as self. So you're going to want to make sure you have that. You can think of it as whenever you add self in there, it's attaching itself to this class. And that gives you access to other properties and methods and things like that inside of this class. We'll talk about that in just a sec. But basically, we just want to say print, I need tacos. So now we can say hungry person is equal to a person and then hungry person dot speak. And it says, I need tacos. Now let's create a better example of an actual person class. So let's create a person in here. This comes with a dunder method, a magic method called init, and you can pass in anything, but it always takes self as the first parameter. So it can take a name, it can take an age, and it can take a food that it wants to eat. And then we can say self.name is equal to name. This allows us to use this later. Self.age is equal to age. This allows us to use it later. Self.food is equal to food. This allows us to use it later. And then we can say def speak self, and it's going to say in here, print feed me more self.food. And this is an f string. So we're going to want to make sure that we're using f at the beginning of that. And let's pluralize that by adding an f. We can also say def get name self print the name of this person is, and yeah, we can just use a different type of print basically. Uh, this only works with prints, not necessarily with strings. Uh, so we're going to use a comma in here to use a second parameter in the print function and self.name. Okay, so let's create me. Caleb is equal to a person. Oh, look at that. Three positional requirements needs a name, age, and a food. So let's go ahead and create. Caleb, 30, pizza, mm, no, tacos, taco, 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 Caleb, mm, still a class, but we can do Caleb dot, hit tab, we get all sorts of information in here, speak, Caleb dot, tab, get name, and says, feed me more tacos, actually that's double pluralized, I should have just wrote regular taco in there without the S, and then get name. The name of this person is Caleb. Now, why is this important? Because I don't know where all that went, so let's just hit up until I find it. Init took name, age, and food, and then we assigned it name, age, and food so that we could use self.name, self.age, self.food throughout this entire class. In speak, we said self.food. So once it was set here, we could use it in here because we have access to self. Get name is using self.name, same thing. We assigned self.name is equal to whatever original name we put in there. Uh, and then we can use self dot because it's taking in self as well. Last but not least, there is one in here that I want to go over called string str self. And that indenting was weird, so that executed it for me. And in here we could say a return statement of self dot name. So Caleb is equal to, and let's go get rid of that. Okay. But if I do print Caleb, it now actually prints the self.name. Whereas regularly, it just says this is executing from the main file, whatever file this is. It's using the person class at some memory location. But when you print the actual name with underscore, underscore, string, underscore, underscore, or a dunder string, it's going to return self.name. Let's do a quick little demo of packages. So in Python, there's this thing called pip. And you can see your pip version by doing pip dash v. Pip dash v will show you your pip version. Uh, I'm using Python 3.7.2 and pip 18.1. Technically, both of those are older versions at time of recording, but you know, I'm aware and that's okay. So to install a package, you just do pip install and then some package name. And you can get the package name from pypy.org. So you do pip install, and let's say you wanted to install Django. You could do pip install Django with a capital D, and then you could do pip show Django. And this shows me that the latest version that I can get is 3.0.5. Now let's say I want to get rid of this. I can do pip uninstall Django. 
<laughs> yep, I want to delete that. Basically just get rid of the uh, excess files in there. And now I can do pip show Django again and nothing shows up because there are no packages called Django. If you ever want to see all of your packages, you could do pip freeze. And this will show you all of your packages. These are all the packages I have on my computer. Uh, not in a virtual env if you're familiar with those. These are just all the things that my computer tends to use with the packages that I use globally. Okay, let's take a look at try and accept. So let's hop back into IPython. And try and accept is basically saying you're going to try some code, and if it doesn't work, you're going to then accept an error. Accept stands for exception. So you're going to ex accept, I'm saying accept, the exception, and then you can handle that error. So if I try to do something that does not work in Python, such as one divided by zero, I get this thing called a zero division error. And if I try to run any code below this, so if I wrote one divided by zero, and then print hello world, hello world is not going to show up because basically my program died at this point. It said, there's an error, I don't know how to handle it. And so in Python, you need to learn how to handle that. And you do that with a try and accept. So we can try, one divided by zero, and then we can accept any sort of exception as E, and then we can print whatever E is. We can also print type of E, and we didn't get that error anymore. In fact, we could do one more in here, print this still runs, and we can see that this still runs, even though it got a division by zero error. So why is that good? Well, because now we can try basically any sort of complex thing, something we're not totally aware of. So if we said, hey, user, give me two numbers, and the user says number one is 10, and the second number is zero, and we try to divide those numbers, we're going to get an error. And what we could say is accept this particular error. We can say accept zero division error, print cannot do that. Sorry, print program still runs normally. And look at that. Basically, this died and the code was not able to run. Now, actually, a better example of this is print show me. And this is not going to work for us whatsoever. So we can see that it actually died on line two here, doing 10 divided by zero. This was not executed. Python said there was an error on this line. There was a zero division error specifically on this line. Don't execute this. Just hop out of this section and go straight into the exception area and then execute that code. And because there was no other errors in here, we can continue to run our program. Now, why is that important? Users are dangerous. That's why users are dangerous. We try to add malicious data all over the point. We try to break things, especially as programmers. We're notoriously bad for this. We try to break every single program uh, that we work with. We try to break websites. We try to break programs. We try to break Python code. It's just sort of what a lot of us do. And the thing is, some people don't even know they're trying to do it. So if I asked you for two numbers and I was just going to divide them, and I said, give me number one, and you said 100. And then I asked you for number two and you said zero. Well, my program is going to try to divide both of those numbers. But it didn't know you were going to give a zero. And that actually caused a problem. And so by catching that error, we can make sure that our program does not die. All right, so that's not everything to do with Python. There's actually a lot more to do with Python, such as importing modules and packages and things like that. There's unit testing, nested functions, decorators, generators, virtual environments, all sorts of things. Then we could get into things like working with sockets, databases, frameworks like Django or Flask, or working with data science, uh, such as the pandas package or the numpy package. There's a lot that we did not cover in this crash course. And again, it's because this is a crash course. This is not meant to be a, a super in-depth course. Now, for more details on pretty much everything we've learned about here, and probably about another 80% more, I do have a course called Python for Everybody. You can go to pythonforeverybody.com to access that. It is hosted all over the place, but check out the links on pythonforeverybody.com.